On this episode of What's What, traditional and modern perspectives on death and embracing death as an essential part of life. Warning, this episode contains material that may be disturbing to some listeners and viewers. All right. Yo. So. Welcome back. Thanks. Good to have you. Yeah, nice to be back. It's been a while. Had a little bit of a break. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm excited about today's episode. Death. Yeah. I think it's got such a bad rap. Does have a bad rap. You know? It's yeah. It's like, so I guess part of this whole episode's come about because um, I read a book called Death. Mm-hmm. by Saad Guru. Saad Guru is the guru behind the Isha Yoga Foundation. Okay. Um, he's a bit of a celebrity guru kind of dude, uh, a little bit controversial. Um, but, I mean, I got I got his book by accident. I was, like, staying up in the mountains, and I had forgotten a book. And I asked the lady who ran the place, like, hey, do you have any books? Like, maybe some guests have left behind. And then she said, oh, this book was given to me by a guest staying here and it's the only English book I have and she gave it to me which was funny because my grandmother is like a follower of Sadhguru and I've actually been to his um, Isha Yoga I wouldn't call it a yeah ashram (laughs) in Coimbatore in India I was taken there when I was young to go and see no idea where I had no idea what I was looking at but now fitting the pictures back together I realized that I've been to his place was he um, there or is he dead? No, he's still around. He's still around. Um, he travels a lot, lectures a lot. So um, what is, so you read this book mm-hmm. just titled Death. Yeah. And what is, what's the, one of the main themes? I mean, so he's Indian, so he's following the Indian belief of reincarnation and karma and um, that trajectory and nirvana. And so his belief um, is that we, we are all, everything in the universe can be compared to as like a bubble, okay? And um, there's two kind of aspects of your bubble, you know, the volume of your bubble, how big is your bubble, and then the thickness of your, the skin of your bubble. And he says, the best way to die is to, is to have as big of a bubble as possible with as thin of a skin as possible, so that when you pop, you don't create a lot of reverberation. So there's not a lot of tension and resistance, exactly. karmic tension and mm-hmm. resistance built up. So he says through your life, you have the, uh, this is your opportunity to grow your bubble. So ex- you could mm-hmm. maybe look at that as like expanding your consciousness mm-hmm. and minimizing the amount of tension and friction that you have with other things going on mm-hmm. and objects that can bump you. And he says, this is basically the effect of, ridding yourself of karma in this life um, it's a great visual i remember when you told me that a couple of months ago mm-hmm. and it immediately resonated with me and i was able to see that see my own existence in this world as a sort of bubble yeah and so some pe- yeah and so some people if you have a very thick skin and a small bubble if you get bumped you're more likely to go flying across <laughs> the metaverse or whatever <laughs> space we're in the cosmic the, room yeah the cosmic room um the other thing that he kind of talks about is uh that death and life and i think we see this in a lot of eastern philosophy that death and life are two faces of the same coin mm-hmm. and that um the way we have our societies develop now is in a very like fearful uh fearful idea of death when in reality, we actually don't know what's on the other side of that and it could be really blissful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and it could, it, and the same way that you come into living kind of spontaneously when you're born and you're entering a whole new existence, maybe the same thing. It's just another form of being born into the deathly existence. Interesting. Yeah, I could dig that. I think what people are afraid of, because I want to talk about this is an important part. I think that what people are afraid of is not having the conscious memory of this life. You know, Alan Watts kind of talks about this. He says that the death in itself is like, it's not that big of a deal for the person that's going through it. It's all the attachments that we have, all the memories, all the relationships, all the things that we've accrued through this life that we're going to lose because... Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it's debatable whether or not you take these memories with you into another life. There have been cases where people seem to remember their previous mm -hmm. iterations, their previous incarnations. Um, but for as, as far as we know, you kind of this consciousness maybe isn't a race, but you don't have the same connection to it when you're here in this physical body. So when you go into the next iteration, it's kind of like starting anew, even though the yeah. maybe the energy is the same. And I think that's what scares people because we, we develop so many attachments to our relationships, mm -hmm. to our, our things, to our ideas, to our ego in this world. And to lose that, even if you do believe in reincarnation, to think that but it's the only it's funny because it's like the only thing that is certain for every single human mm -hmm. that lives on this planet. Yeah. yeah and has ever lived. It's the only certainty, right. you know, yeah. that <laughs> maybe that's what scares us so much about it. I don't know. I was is. young when I decided I wasn't going to be scared of it. Really? Yeah. I remember being a child and being like, it happens to everyone. It can't be that bad. That's awesome because <laughs> I was terrified of it. I used to have uh. crippling anxiety about my parents dying. Not me personally. I was okay with the idea of dying or as okay as I could be. But it was other people dying uh. that I was terrified of, really terrified of it. I've let go of it, though, since I've you know been friends with you and since I've been going on this whole journey here in Bali. It's definitely given me more acceptance because you know how they are here. Mm. There's, I mean, there. Well, you want to talk uh. about this now? You want to talk about the Balinese stuff? Um, yeah, we can start. We're going to talk a little bit about rituals that we've researched in mm -hmm. the East, death rituals in the East, and maybe I think compare them to the West. Yeah, nice I think that's a good idea. So yeah, what do they do here? Well, so we, we see it. We see it sometimes. We see a funeral. The, the word for the ceremony is Nangban. It's Nangban? Na, Naben. 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 No G. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. It's a silent G. Silent G. <laughs> So what they do is they'll, if a person dies in order to save cost, they'll, well, they'll, so it no, it's well, not go ahead. Why don't you take cost. it? Because, okay. So it's, but kind of is though. No, it's because there's certain things that need to be done the when a person dies. Right, and also right. depending on what status that person had, there's more commitment that the family needs to make. Yeah. And there's certain ceremonies that need to be done. And if they're not done, then you're not giving them a good send off. Mm -hmm. and, because the and then you're putting them at jeopardy in their afterlife. You're not giving right. the your ancestors the, um, what's it called? The re like reverence that they're, they deserve. Right. So but let's put this in a context for people. The reason they do that is because they believe that when your, your soul or your energy or whatever leaves this body, this physical structure that it's in, that there can be a battle between the evil spirits and the good spirits and the evil spirits. Oh, I didn't know this. Okay. Yeah, so that so they you can, need to send them off in the best possible yeah, way. Yeah, to give yeah. them the best chance to make it to whatever the, the positive mm -hmm. side of, of that is. Because so that, here there's also a lot of belief that your ancestors influence mm -hmm. your life. And if you like, if you have a temple for your ancestors and then you go periodically and give offerings. And a lot of the time they're praying to their ancestors because with this belief that they will either help or hinder mm -hmm. them. Right. Right. Um, so this is why. So Naben, it's not everywhere, but there are certain villages um, in Bali where they they have group. Um, it happens Grace. actually here in Uluwatu as well. They had a big Naben like last year. Um, they have a group uh, ceremony for a funeral. Um, so what happens is, yeah, I think there's like a small ceremony and the body is placed in the ground. Mm -hmm. And then when it's time for the Naben, the bodies are exhumed and then cremated mm -hmm. and so it's part of hindu custom to cremate the body mm -hmm. um very different to the west because again they feel like they've got to eliminate this physical structure yeah. in order for the soul or whatever you call it to to go into its next existence yeah and there's also, even a belief in that i read in Sadhguru's book that like people close to the dead person shouldn't have the dead person's belongings like mm. shouldn't take their clothes like don't you can give it to a stranger who didn't know them, but the people who are close to that body shouldn't like hang on to the physical attachments, even in terms of belongings. Why is that? Because it gives the spirit oh, something to come back something to. Something to come back I mean, to. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, which makes sense. So another thing they do is they like you were describing with the the graves. So they bury them, and then when it's time for the naben, the big one where they do multiple people together, partly to save costs. No, a lot <laughs> of it is, but it's. It's to save cost, but also be able to pool the resources so yeah, that you yeah. can ensure that your ancestors get. If you right, were to do right. it single handedly, it would be really hard for every single person in the community to pay 
their dues. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you pool the resources and have one large ceremony, you can do it properly. You can do it properly. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So another thing they do, because I watched a video of them doing it in a village in Nusa Penida. Nusa Penida is another island right off the coast of Bali. It's still technically part of Bali, but a separate island. Where they So they, they did 13 of them. And they put them, depending on the cast that the person was in, they either put them in a lion, an ox, right? Mm -hmm. Like a, sarco or like a sarcophagus a that's temple a shape, temple shape. Temple yeah. shape, oxen shaped, lion shaped. And they burn it, like Rishi said, but then they actually pull the bones out if they haven't burned completely and crush them. Have mm. you seen this before? Mm -hmm. Where they no. crush the bones. Again, this idea that the physical structure needs to be, I don't know if eliminated is the right word, but to be dissolved. broken down, yeah. dissolved. From this realm. Yeah, as much as possible for it to get, again, to give it the best chance, the soul a best chance, mm -hmm. the best chance to ascend, mm -hmm. which is and pretty crazy. And I think crazy. the whole kind of mentality around death maybe in developing parts of the world is a much more run of the mill kind of experience. Well, and there, think, yeah, there's intentionally a separation. Yeah. They, they want it to be. I remember more, talking to one of my staff and she was like, Oh, my dad died. And I was like, how old was he? And she was like 68. And I was like, that's pretty young. She was like, no, that's pretty old in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. 68. Yeah. Well, you do see some older people. I don't know how old they are. Maybe they just look older than, than they actually are. 68, average, according she did, to her. She seemed unsurprised. Well, I think, okay, so getting to what we were talking about a second ago, there is this very casual attitude that a lot of Indonesians generally, mm -hmm. Balinese specifically, mm -hmm. have towards death, right? I mean, the first dead person I ever saw was when I first moved to Uluwatu. A guy had a motorbike accident. He was just laying. I mean, I'm pretty sure he was dead. He looked like it. And I was just, and the people, you've seen how they are around accidents. Yeah. They're just kind of like, yeah, you know, it yeah. is what it is. Whereas if you're in the West, you know, they'd be calling the ambulance or be freaking out. Not. Yeah. Not or they're here. like taking pictures. Or they're taking pictures. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a very different attitude. It's a very, sure. yeah. Life is in some ways cheap here, but it, it's, it's not just that. It's not the, just the fact that life is kind of cheap, right? Because of all the issues that come along with living in a country like Indonesia. But it's also because they do have this belief that it's not the end. Mm, this mm -hmm. isn't the end. This is they they always talk about it in terms of a transition, a mm -hmm. transformation. That's true. You know, this is not a goodbye. It's not or not a goodbye forever. But yeah, you contrast that with because as a Westerner at first, that was kind of shocking to me yeah. to see that, to see how casual they were about it and kind of scared me. It was like, well, shit happened kind of on your own. right? Mm -hmm. You have a motorbike accident or something. They're not going to be rushing to help you. But then you look at the other side of it and you, I think about my, my upbringing being so terrified of death, like we just talked about, that's, that's also not desirable. And that's not, that's not a nice way to live. That to actually constantly... leaves you, I feel like with a lot more attachment yeah, when it's actually for time sure. for when it happens maybe to somebody else, or even when it's time for you to go, cause you've lived in fear of it, mm -hmm. um, well, which and... can be frightening, I think. And this gets into, you want to talk about the commercialization or that story oh, yeah. around uh, around embalming specifically. So if you haven't seen Midnight Gospel, it's pretty interesting, trippy. Very trippy show. Very trippy, like animated. animated, adult animation. And they get into these really deep philosophical discussions with some just like tripped out animation scenes playing out while they're talking about these things. And one of the episodes that we watched was with a mortician. And she's explaining to the host this kind of like cosmic time world traveler guy who's just going and having these interesting conversations. The mortician is talking to him about the history of embalming in the United States and was saying that during the civil war, the Northern soldiers who fought and died in the South, their families wanted to see them one last time, mm. but it was such a long distance they had to travel. Mm. And then some, some entrepreneurs figured out that at the time you could put arsenic in them. Arsenic's a preservative. Yeah. And then, and you could preserve the body, send them on the train, and then the the families would be able to see the their loved one who yeah. died. So that's how this whole embalming and how does preservation it, cause in started. In, like in India and in Hindu belief, like you cremate the body as quickly as possible, hmm. pretty much. Like on the day, usually. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Because you again don't want to leave this thing hanging around that hmm. lets the entity or whatever have something to cling on to. So how does it work? Cause I've always, the first dead body I saw was my stepbrother actually. Your stepbrother? Yeah. Really? My stepdad's son. And I remember it was in a room and he was embalmed 
and he was in the coffin and I couldn't even be in the room. Was this in, like, where it was, was in this? Singapore. In Singapore. Um, he was cremated later, but he was, um, maybe he was not embalmed. I don't know. He had makeup on and he was like lying <laughs> in the, you know, and I, I remember like peeping in and being like, oh no. And just like running out of the room, sort of. I wasn't even that young. I was like 20, you know, probably 10, no, five years ago or something. Um, that, I mean, that is but so how does it work? Because you have in the, you, in the. Western world, you have a wake. Yeah, in in and like more Protestant, yeah, more Protestant traditions, you'll have a wake where yeah they prepare the body. And what's interesting is that as we're talking about this, I realize East and West kind of does it. That they're at the core of it, they're doing the same thing. They're just going about it in different ways. So yeah, yeah they have a wake, and they'll prepare the body, preserving it, yeah. making up, dressing it up. So yeah. so that you will have wakes. I forget what it's called, but you have some where it open casket basically or closed casket. And the the idea, I guess, is kind of the same, which is you're preparing the body to go into its its next. But iteration. the difference between the east and the west is normally the family will prepare the body. Right. In right. the east. Yeah, and this is what that midnight gospel episode mm -hmm. was talking about, which was the these entrepreneurs that went in and preserved the bodies. And the way she described it was pretty trippy. She was saying that they would they would do these these embalming procedures to the bodies, and they would like hang them up like advertisements oh. for the trains that were, you remember this part? Yeah. I was like, my God. So anyway, they, there was an inherent um, kind of commercialization. A middleman kind of came into yeah. that process. I mean, this was, you yeah. know, in the late 1700s in America, you know, where industrialization is, or late 1800s, sorry, not 1700s. So industrialization is right around the corner. You're having this very like strong entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. and you got these guys that are doing this embalming. So what happened after the war is they wanted to maintain their business model and get into what you were saying about the separation. So what they did is they they kind of said, well, don't worry about the body. You know, the, it's the body's dangerous. It's disease. Mm -hmm. It's got to like we'll take care of it. We're the professionals. So getting to what you're saying that whereas the, the family used to prepare that clean the body, prepare the body for its transition. It was taken over by essentially business interest and people that were were selling this embalming fluid and selling the whole process Package, yeah. Yeah, of, of death in the Western world. So because of that, according to the, the mortician on the Midnight Gospel, that's part of what created that separation. Whereas in the West, it's not really it's so taboo mm. to sit there with the body. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, but it kind of sounds like in India, they want to cremate the body as quickly as possible, too. Cremate, yes, yes. But I think even also in Islam, I know there's a long process behind the preparation of the body and it must be done by the family. And mm. um, I think the act of doing that before the cremation is already your way of touching the body, washing mm -hmm. the body, coming to terms with the fact of what's happened. Right, right. And then you cremate and you literally watch it go up into the ether. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how you get your closure. Whereas... I mean, in the West, yeah, there's just a different way of going about it. But that is, that is important, though, mm -hmm. the, very important, the whole process of seeing the body, touching the body, right? Where in the West, you don't do that. Like the, fa the family member doesn't do yeah. that. that yeah. has been, that's been outsourced to the, to the morticians, mm -hmm. to, the, to those folks. So you but have a wake, is, and that's normally like a couple days after yeah, the death. Yeah, I think death. it's like three days after the death or something. And then on the day of the wake, the body is buried? I don't know, actually. I'm not that steeped in the Western either. Protestant traditions. I know there's a wake. Is it different for the Catholics? Probably a little bit different for the Catholics, mm. I would imagine. I mean, similar in some ways. I don't I actually don't know what the Catholics do. I don't know. My dad was raised Catholic, but he calls himself a recovering Catholic. And I was baptized, but we never went to church. Mm. Think just bad. And I have a very Roman Catholic I mean, name. I used to give you a god parents or something. Yeah, Michael Christopher Syracuse. Very, but I don't know hardly anything about Catholicism. But what? But that except. But I I do know that it it would not be normal for a, a, a just a normal family with Christian yeah. Catholic roots in America to sit there with the body and prepare the body and itself. Dress it because they yeah. even the spiritual side of it. I think that they would have a priest come in and do do something that's probably what the tradition is in the catholic church that the priest comes in well i know that the priest, co priest comes in gives like the whatever it's called the final mm -hmm. blessing and then whatever happens after that happens but so do I you want to be buried or cremated cremated for sure 
My yeah. dad always told me that he wants to be cremated and he wants his ashes spread across the Monterey Bay with uh, Van Morrison into the Mystic Plane. That's achievable. Uh, yeah, that's totally it's easy. It's not like far-fetched. No, it's not far-fetched <laughs> at all. But then it was interesting because I was watching this video of the Balinese in the Nabin ceremony. Mm -hmm. And after they had crushed the bones, so they cremated a body, any bones that were left, they crushed, and then they put the, the ash into in a coconut. A coconut. Yeah. And then they went out into the ocean and they flushed it out. And I just thought of my dad, and I mean, haven't done this and won't have to do it for a long time, hopefully. But it, it just seemed, again, kind of these similarities. I think there's an intuitive mm. sense that people have. that it's like, yeah, of course, I'm going to burn the body and I'm going to spread the ashes because yeah. it gives back to the earth, right? I mean, yeah. it's the whole hippie idea. Of Maybe just, just going back, yeah. Yeah. Something else. And also you want to disperse the ashes as much as possible yeah, so that you're right. not giving it something to cling on <laughs> right, to again. Right. And having that urn in your house is just mm. like this reminder mm. constantly of what happened. And you want to kind of even for the people living to be able to shed themselves of mm. the sorrow of it all. Which That's is why like point. having a gravestone is just, just like physical reminder hmm. place that you can go back to it's a bit more of a clinging yeah you the attachment but then again. i mean it's different there's two things i want to talk about here the first one is um part of hindu custom is also that like right after the cremation you need to go home and have a shower hmm. like wa and sh wash yourself and then even in bali like if somebody close in your family or you've participated in a funeral recently you're not allowed to go to temple and you're not allowed to go to certain celebrations. So, um, maybe. so there is like a dirtiness associated with the procedure, but I wonder where that comes from. I wonder if that's like just as a, a respect thing kind of, you know, or is like to the dead or is it a dirt dirty thing or, and you don't, I'm trying to think of a Western equivalent well, I that. think that, that, that it's maybe like it's a, a mix morning, of both. Morning period, you know? Yeah, yeah, maybe. I think it's a mix of spiritual, emotional, and maybe practical. Mm. It, it's kind of like what you were describing with the the cleaning. Remember, you had that lady come and clean physically. Yeah, and, feng shui and, in my house. Yeah, yeah, but she was talking about how when the dirt accumulates, like even that dirt and that grime that can accumulate in the corners of your house, that that'll attract the, the demon energy, mm -hmm. so to speak. Maybe that's not exactly how she put it, but that's essentially what she was getting at. That there is a process, a physical process that takes place when somebody dies. You know, the, mm -hmm. the tissues start to, to break down and it decomposes. And there is something, I'm not going to say dirty or dangerous about it, but that is, that is a, a different process that's happening than the bodily process that living organisms have. Yeah. And we do have to be careful with that. Because in that transition, there are things, whether you, whether you label it as disease or some kind of demonic evil energy yeah. latching onto that. I and mean, this is why Hindus believe to be vegetarian as well. Mm -hmm. Or like eating a dead animal is bringing that dead energy yeah. into your body. Yeah. That's also where the Absolutely. belief comes from. So we're, can, we, can we take a break? We got to do a cool the camera down slash commercial break. Yeah. And then what do you want to talk, talk about on the other well, end? Well, the other thing I wanted to talk about was maybe... Like ancestor worship, cool. A little yeah, bit. Yeah, I'm down with that. And then we can. And then we can talk about euthanasia. Get into something a little bit more controversial <laughs> <laughs> for part two. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about <laughs> maid. Did you read any about maid? I did. Yeah. Medical assistance might, in dying I might, in Canada. I might, I might be less controversial than you think. I might have to agree with you. Yeah, because we'll see. it's pretty fucked, right? It's pretty fucked. All right, but let's talk about the ancestry <laughs> stuff, and then we'll we'll get yeah. to that. All right, see you on the other end. We're back for part two, and it sounds like the construction workers have finished their lunch break. So we <laughs> apologize for the buzzing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Some, like quiet yelling that you hear in the background. God, it's just everywhere now. Just building, building, building. Yeah, there's a lot of development happening in Bali. Ugh, it's so sad. Another episode. Okay, so you wanted to talk about ancestors. Yeah. Um, I grew up in... Hong Kong and Singapore for people who don't know. And there, there's a very like big festival called the Hungry Ghost Festival. And it's at that time when you do like you go to the graves of your ancestors and you clean them up, you sweep and you like lay flowers and offerings and you burn like fake money and you burn uh, and at Chinese funerals, they often burn like paper effigies of stuff like 
they'll burn like a paper house and they'll burn a paper car. And the idea is that you're sending up all those material belongings to your ancestors in the afterlife. So you're dissolving all the worldly attachments and hopefully making it easier for that. Or, oh no, they're no, taking you're it literally like sending them cash. Yeah, really? you're like burning the cash mm. so that they are like rich in there. Because you want to, you want to make sure your ancestors are happy because mm. that apparently really dictates your life in Eastern philosophy. That's interesting. It's kind of contradictory though, because on one hand, it's well, there's, there's a difference to, between the in. I think where Indian Indians will go back and do ceremonies like on the anniversary, but they're usually very small. Like the Hungry Ghost Festival and the the Chinese belief, it's like a big celebration and like feasting, and it's a time for the family to come together. Um, so that's different. Like uh, my grandfather passed away, and in India, my my mom. My grandma recently went with my my uncle to do the ceremony that the you're suppo supposed to do as the family of a deceased. But okay. this is like a few years later. So there are and then in Japan, there's like a very interesting custom where seven days after the funeral, you go back and then seven weeks you go back and then at seven months you go back and then at seven years you go back and then I think it's done. Go back, go to, back to the grave to and the grave. do a prayer. Um, so it's interesting that the mourning and the the remembrance of your ancestors is a much more of a communal effort, I find, mm. in the East than in the West. Yeah, and there is this recognition that those ancestral spirits are still out there and they have some practical mm -hmm. impact. And on you owe and you there. owe them something. And you do owe them something, yeah. Which makes sense. Yeah. I mean, we're all part of this ancestral chain. Yeah. Maybe not us because we don't have kids, but we're the last link in the chain. For now. <laughs> For now. That's true. I have a niece. That's true. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so, so okay. So then from here, let's talk about the, the kind of modern views uh -huh. of, of death. And specifically, I want to talk about, I know we, you were reluctant to talk about this, but you said that we could. Talk about the the MAID programs in Canada. Mm -hmm. So MAID's its acronym stands for Medical Assistance in Dying. Mm -hmm. It's essentially state. But sponsored. I was reading that Canada has like pretty much the most liberal yeah. laws in the world for assisted. Because there's two things. There's euthana euthanasia, which is like putting somebody out of suffering, mm -hmm. is from what I understand, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's assisted suicide, which is giving somebody the permission to kill themselves with medical intervention yeah yeah but they it, right there and is a lot of overlap and then there's there. there's um like passive uh which is where you take people off of life support mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. can also be considered some kind of assisted death you know yeah so yeah. there's different categories but basically canada has said yes to all of them yeah right yes right and then the, the idea of suffering is an important one mm -hmm. because you're right that there is this more conservative idea of what euthanasia is, which is somebody has a terminal, terminal mm -hmm. illness. They're very old. Mm -hmm. they, in maybe a just, lot of pain. In a lot of pain. You just Cannot allow them. Right, yeah. You allow them to die. But I guess that's where me personally, I kind of draw the line. When you take an active role in expediting the death mm -hmm. by actually putting some pharmaceutical product into somebody and killing them with that. Mm -hmm. That's just, oh. I and was then, reading the statistics in Canada and it said out of like 100% of applications, 81% of them are allowed. And then, 81%. Yeah. And even in the cases. And then it's like 4% are rejected. And then 13.5% of the people die before they can have the procedure. By, by what means? Like they naturally. die naturally. Okay. They die naturally before they can have the procedure. And then it said the average age of people going for assisted deaths is 76. Just to put things in a bit of perspective. I know it's maybe yeah. not what lines up with the laws at the moment, but it was interesting. I was like, 81%, that's a lot. And then, okay, 4%, of, only 4% rejection seems very little. And then this 13.5% or whatever of people who die naturally before they can have the assistance it's just kind of, yeah, I guess, I guess it goes to show you the types of people that are applying for this 
well, it could procedure. Be, yeah, I mean, it could be a lot of different types of people. What I take issue with is they're opening it up to people that are homeless and have mental yeah mental i think disorders. before the mental disorder thing is new i think yeah, that one's so new is, and that's why it's kind of come back into the news and been it used to just be terminal illness or like terminal or, physical illness yeah illness or also like just general decline which is i think they're a definition for like being old mm -hmm. um but yes, when it starts to become about mental illness and homelessness and home, too, home. I mean, I mean all, they fall into a similar category. They do. Um, but that somebody can point to that and say, well, this is the reason why. I mean, because like you said, they have to go through this application process. Mm -hmm. They have to submit their reasons for wanting to do it. Mm -hmm. And then they're either approved or not approved by the state. I didn't know that about the 81 percent being approved. It makes sense to me. I don't want to get too political with this. To me, it seems to be a reflection of how that socialized medical system is struggling. Because mm -hmm. think about it from the government's perspective, instead of taking care of these people for another 5, 10, 15, 20 years, it's much cheaper and easier just to kill them. Mm. That sounds pretty brutal, and I don't think anybody would come out and say it directly, yeah. but that must play into this at some level, in some yeah. way. I mean, yeah, especially that age, I suppose. If your system's already struggling, you're at least giving people an option to exit your system yeah yeah uh, what's interesting is that in canada you can only apply for this if you are a canadian and you're uh, eligible for the socialized health care system actually well that and that is, <laughs> that makes and they, sense and then. they wrote there that that's to prevent suicide tourism which is actually a thing that happens like so between 2008 and 2018 there was 1250 german citizens who went to switzerland to have this procedure done because in oh. Switzerland, they it's open to all nationalities. Whoa. And in Switzerland, the law is it's a very gray area, but it's not illegal if you can prove that there was no motive. So if the person administering the drug had a motive to do it, like money, financial, financial whatever, then it would be considered um, illegal. If there is no motive and it's just out of compassion, it's not technically illegal. The other thing that they do is like, if you're, as long as like, it's not the doctor, the one who presses the syringe, like it should be the person who's having about to die to be the one to press the syringe or like the doctor cannot feed the pill, it needs to be the person who's gonna die giving, self-administering. Wow. So it's very, I was reading about all the different laws in different countries of what's permissible and what's not. Um, Japan I, kind of follows a similar path as Switzerland, but they also have these very aging populations where, yeah, I don't know. So interesting. Well, that, that's a trip. So the doctor, just to get back to the Switzerland example, so the doctor can do everything to facilitate yeah, All of that process up like until the point. They can prepare the plate with the pill on it. Or they can't administer it. On well, one, no, it can. They they can, but it they, that runs them in a risk of being in a gray area of as far as intent. I mean, it's so being, hard of, of being at murder, basically. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean, in my mind, that if your if your whole practice or part of your medical practice is based off of that. I'm not going to go as far to say that you're complicit in murder, but in some cases, I mean, in some places, that's the biggest, like, uh, the thing that I think most people are concerned about is well, that if you create this freedom to self suicide or assisted suicide, who is the biggest culprit is who is the one who's actually doing the assisting right, and can right. that person really be trusted? Well, and, and what is their motive? I mean, if, if you look on the government side or all of it, that the, there is some motive to not, like we said, not have as many people in the system draining the resource out of the system. And there's also, if it is a for-profit enterprise and that's their business, then of course they're not going to turn away customers mm -hmm. if, if that's how they make their money or part of their money. But to me, it comes... But the criteria to, to, to be accepted is, is pretty vague. It's and, pretty loose. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. loose. And now, and they've said anybody over the age of 18 in Canada can mm -hmm. apply for this if they fulfill it's like four criteria and they're not it's before it was like they said that there was like a foreseeable chance they were going to die it's like 
well, everyone's going to yeah, die. Yeah, everyone's going to die. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I think it's 100% certain that you're going to die. Yeah. Well, and that's why it comes back to this question, which is how much suffering is acceptable? Mm. What level of, of suffering are you willing to accept in order to to keep doing what you're doing or end your life? Because Yeah, I, and it's also what means are you taking to get out of the suffering? So I think mm-hmm. part of part of the criteria or kind of the process that goes on before the assisted death is um count like you have to be at least referred to a counselor but it's not like you have to go for counseling it's like the options need to be presented in front of you for you to take them like alternative like medicines or don't you think that any psychologist but they're not they're not they're not mandatory and even if they were, don't you think that any good healer, whatever modality that they're they're using, would would tell you that no, it's going to be okay. You have hope. Yes, but the point that, is, is that these these healers or the like spiritual practices are not mandatory in the in the lead up to this. Mm-hmm. They're just referrals. Um, yeah, making it even more loose, and yeah, yeah, the higher probability that you're able to get approved and because I was reading, I, I was like, okay, I wonder what Sadhguru has to say about suicide. Yeah, yeah he's what written you, a whole what book about death, and he, he basically said like, anybody who's contemplating suicide should just do yoga and like try to look at things in a more spiritual sense, and then you wouldn't, or you need to start educating kid, like people when they're younger about spirituality and start putting kids into yoga and giving them mindfulness practices. And he said, if, if any society is able to really integrate spiritual teachings, you would not find Mm -hmm. as many suicides. Mm -hmm. And that, and that's my belief with it, that it's Mm -hmm. like, if you're even at that point for regardless of what reason, Mm -hmm. if you're willing to take an active role in ending your own life, then something's going to miss there Mm -hmm. because I don't, I think you know this, that my good friend read, He committed suicide and he was early 40s and looking at it from his perspective, if I were to be able to, I did talk to him. I talked to him two weeks before he died. I I don't, did I tell you this story? He was, so he was the boyfriend of my longtime girlfriend's sister and the four of us. So it was Ruby and Red and then me and Elizabeth. The four of us were like a little family. Red didn't have a good connection with his family. His sister was, you know, I hadn't talked to her in a long time and that was his family because Ruby mm-hmm. and Elizabeth had a very like solid family. And then Ruby and Red broke up and he went into this very deep depression and it was fueled by drugs and alcohol. And in his mind, he had lost all hope. Like yeah. he had lost everything. His dad had died a few months prior to that. His adopted family was gone. And in his mind that that level of suffering was not acceptable. Mm-hmm. But, and then I saw him two weeks before he died. So Ruby calls me and says, you know, Red is threatening to kill himself. He's got a, a noose. He says he has a noose hanging above his bed. And can you just go over there and check on him? Mm-hmm. So I go over there and check on him and I go into his room and sure enough, he's got a noose because he had rafters kind of like this hanging above his bed. And sure enough, he had a noose hanging there. And mean, he's kind of this, he was like a punk rock dude, but he was also very conservative. It's the interesting thing about Red. He was like a Santa Cruz, San Jose punk rock glass blower but hardcore conservative gun owner. Mm. So because of that, he wasn't really able to express his true emotions. He just mm-hmm. kind of like wrote it off. And I'm just kind of flabbergasted by it. Didn't really know how to respond. But my, my point in telling, and then yeah, two weeks later, I get the call from Elizabeth you know, saying that he had committed suicide. And I remember being so angry at him mm-hmm. because getting back to this question, what amount of suffering is acceptable well it's subjective right it is suffering is subjective and the thing is that i've i've been in that place where i felt like i can't go on anymore but i'm so glad that i did and i can't help but think with somebody like red that's made that choice imagine it now so this was 2015 so almost 10 years ago eight years ago that if he were still here how would he feel about that what if what if that had gone another way well i think this is where we where we as the living hold on to a, an attachment, you know, like yeah. you asking yourself that question yeah. has nothing to do with red. Well, anymore, it does. It, well, you it, know? it doesn't anymore, but I, and I hear you and yeah, I, I, I take that point. But if I'm putting myself in his shoes and yes. saying, well, what, what if, 
I know that the suffering was that bad at that point. And yes, I am biased. Yeah, because he probably could have. He probably could have come out of overcome. a deep dark hole and mm-hmm. turned his life around. And but that is. But he didn't. So. He didn't. And, and that's, that's your. Guru. Yeah, Sadhguru's other part of that is okay. So he says suicide is is bad. And if somebody is being like, I want to commit suicide, you should tell them no. Mm-hmm. He, that's what he says. And he, he says you should guide them into looking at you know their life differently. And you should be against suicide. But he said after somebody has committed suicide, it's up to you as the living to release that, mm-hmm. accept it, let mm-hmm. go of it. You know, And I think that's where a lot of people have a hard time. And a lot of people I know who have had friends who've killed themselves have have been angry and been like, that's so selfish of them. You know, they don't, you know, what were the people that they left behind this and this and this, but in the, in the end, that's, that's not your weight to carry in a way as well. You know, it's, True. it's, it's and I think there is a difference between taking your own life and, and asking for your life to be taken. Also, like for me, for me, self-performed suicide in some ways is almost more ethical because you're not involving (laughs) the rest of the people you know it might not be possible for people in their 80s and 90s to like physically do it to themselves but i think if you're actually ready to 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 kill yourself it's a bit better than asking somebody else to do it for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is a really interesting point because I think that part of the reason that people feel more comfortable, because you're taking the opposite stance on I'm it, confused. which I like. I'm no, confused. no, it's it's interesting though, because I think a lot of people would take the the opposite stance. I think I'm with you that at least you're not involving other people. But to medicalize it and to sanitize it in that way makes it seem like it's different than suicide. That it's okay. Yeah, Yeah. which maybe it's not. Maybe it's the same exact thing, but because you're involving a a medical professional and they're administering this drug and it's very sanitized and it's very, it's it's to the point. I mean, I will say there are some aspects of uh, euthanasia that I do really admire. Like I kind of like the idea for very old people to have, or their family in the room with them, you know, be able to time it, to to go in a peaceful way when that's when you when you're not plagued by mental illness or you know when it really is performed properly. Well, God knows what properly is, but when I think when it's performed on people who are well into old age and who are using this as an opportunity to die in the best way possible, you know, without clinging on to everything, being able to have everyone holding them. I think there is some beauty in that. For people who there are is. in a disgruntled yeah. disgruntled state, we can use the bubble analogy again. For people who are in a disgruntled state with thick skin and small bubble who are in a very narrow channel of like, this is my only escape, I think that's when it becomes maybe da- more dangerous yeah. or more unethical. Well, and more karmic tension yes. built up there too because they're, yeah, the bubble analogy is great because when you have that tension that karmic stuff that's built up that it's, it's going to have to come back. Mm -hmm. And by killing yourself, you're only delaying the inevitable, which Mm -hmm. is your soul. If you believe in Mm -hmm. in reincarnation, that your soul is going to have to come back and live, relive that and learn those lessons. But this, so getting to the idea of the form that it takes, because I agree with you that it ideally the best way, way I think that anybody can imagine to die is being very old, surrounded by the people that you love and just kind of slipping away peacefully. Mm -hmm. Now you could make the argument depending on what kind of drug that you're administering, that that process is possible, but it's still accelerated. Mm -hmm. It's still an artificial input Mm -hmm. into the whole process that, that makes it happen. Sadhguru says that that moment that you die is what matters. So like the the thought and feeling that you're feeling in that moment when you die. So you can be like being ripped apart by an alligator, but if you're like, <laughs> I lived a great life, you know, like it's time to go. That is a better death than somebody dying of natural old age, but angry mm-hmm. that they didn't fulfill whatever they wanted to do in their life. Yeah. You know, so yeah. he's like that, that element of what mindset are you in when you actually go is, that makes sense. Is really critical. Yeah, I guess what I would say is that 
me taking this maximalist view on natural processes that I would say that you probably have a better chance of that happening if you're, you've kind of succumbed to the idea that it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And by inserting yourself artificially into the process, you haven't really let go of that. Yeah. You've just wanted to maintain some control you're over just it. Taking it easy. Yeah. You're out. taking an easy yeah. option out and you're maintaining control over it and saying, well, this is when I want to die. This is how it's going to happen. And I mean, to be fair, maybe for some people that does allow them a certain piece. Mm -hmm. And I think for does. a lot of people in their old age, it does. I think but I think if you're opening it up to people who are mentally Oof, ill, if you're homeless. opening this option up to people who are mentally ill or homeless, you're going to find, I think that that at that moment of death, they are going to be clinging yeah. onto mm -hmm. something. I would think so too, because obviously they are. If there's that much pain and suffering, mm -hmm. then obviously they're clinging onto something in this life that they need to work through mm -hmm. and they're going to have to work through anyway. Yeah. Well, it's then a, even looking back like subjective suffering is subjective so maybe maybe it is unbearable. rest in peace red that when he when he had that moment of passing he was like this is my release from, yeah you know and and it maybe did come with sadness and sorrow but let's pray that it it actually he went in a in a peaceful way you know and yeah. i think that was in his own hands and his own choice and i think it's hard to say and it's hard for I think a lot of people to come to terms with when somebody is commit suicide, but um, yeah, it's it's heavy. But I mean, pre like, what about when people die from an accident prematurely? Like, mm. that's also really hard for people to cope with, mm -hmm. you know. So it is, yeah, and I agree with you. And that's kind of the perspective that I've taken on it over mm. the years. Is that, and my dad said something similar. My dad had many people close to him commit suicide throughout his life. And he said that some people are just too sensitive for this world. And like you were saying, it was just so overwhelming. And that was his release. He did feel a sense of peace in that. The issue that I take with it, we've only got a few minutes left. The issue that I take with it is the way that he did it, to hang mm -hmm. himself like that and to put it squarely on Ruby like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. Well, was, then you're leaving, yeah, you're leaving just, the world with a lot of trauma. Yeah, A lot of trauma. And yeah. poor Ruby, you know, she yeah. just carries that with her. I know that she does. And I know how hard. Because he, he basically blamed it on mm -hmm. her. Right? And mm -hmm. that's like, that's so much shit to For throw her, onto somebody. Yeah, yeah. But I hear you. I mean, it's, it, yeah, I don't know. I kind of like, you kind of just let, let it go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best we can do, regardless of what what uh precipitated the death mm -hmm. and how whatever ritual or ceremony you you yeah, engage find in your, after find your way to honor it yeah find your way to honor it accept it because what do they say that there are only two certainties in life death and taxes so yeah well that <laughs> some, people, I mean, they, some people would beg to differ but i'm sure there are probably more than two but yeah i know the tax, <laughs> taxes, taxes thing. i don't that. know <laughs> that's ways around that so we got a couple minutes left. Anything you want to leave people with, Rish? Mm, no, I highly recommend this book. Yeah, Sad Death. Guru. Really good. Um, different then, perspective, different cultural rituals. He also talks about his wife, actually, who he said was so spiritually connected that she was able to choose the moment of her death. Oh, yeah. I remember you telling me this. Super fascinating. We can leave it after this. Like, she... She was like preparing once she heard that it was possible to basically spontaneously leave your, your soul to leave your body. Um, she just started learning, like, I want to do that. And they had like a small daughter and she was like, no, like I've fulfilled my purpose. This is it. I want to go in this way. And then he basically said, like, one day during a meditation, she just like slumped over and died. Oh my God. How, sorry. I'm and not she was to like laugh, a young and but, healthy person. Okay. Yeah. The see, and again, it, so why Fascinating. though? Because, and it, and it was, she they left. Had a young daughter. She, yeah, but she explained it to her daughter. She said, look, I'm going to be going. Was she suffering? Nope. Nope. She had, she'd, she'd, she had, she was like, I need to go now because this is the happiest I'm ever going to be. Whoa. Kind of. I don't know. Interesting way. That is interesting. I well, highly recommend the book. There's loads of weird stories and stuff like that about death. And um, and I will say that not all Indians are cremated. They do say that if you're very, very, very old or like a lot of gurus and stuff are buried because they don't have this residual mm. death energy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Maybe just give some people some food for thought. 
about, yeah. you know, their, yeah. their, their, their inevitable future. Thank you so. very much, Rish. You're a wealth <laughs> of knowledge on this topic. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this one. I don't even want to say, so. you know, the dream I had. Yeah. 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 I had a dream that Rishi died and then I was talking to your mother and like I was distraught. I was I could you know those dreams you have where you like feel it, you know, like and then you appeared behind me. But then I was like, <laughs> then I told myself and I told Gaty that well, Gaty is Rishi's mom. I was like, well, it's not it's not real. Like I know that she it was like I was accepting you to leave. I think it's partly because you left for Europe. Mm. And then we had the disagreement. I was like, Rishi doesn't want to do the show with me anymore. She's probably <laughs> you should see your face on the video of the artificial intelligence one because it was right after we, we recorded the problem. Oh, I know, one. I saw it. And you're like, just, you're like, oh. If anyone wants to see my angry face, we have a YouTube. <laughs> so good. Please subscribe. So, anyway, I think it was more metaphorical. Like, I thought I was going to lose you as a friend and oh. as a co-host. No, so I'm I don't still think, here. Yeah, that's, well, thank you. That uh, speaks a lot to your your character and your commitment to the show. So anyway, yeah, thank you, Rishi. And thank you guys for listening and watching. Definitely like us, subscribe, follow, all that stuff. I don't know what platform you're on. And also, we should definitely say this, that if you are experiencing those feelings about wanting to harm yourself, please, first of all, don't. It's going to be okay. And talk to someone, whoever that someone is, spiritual leader, medical professional, your friends, your family. And we will leave it at that. Thanks. See you next time.